it's quite difficult not to get emotional about Max Verstappen's win because these things don't happen very often. Somebody as young as Max winning a Grand Prix and Max and a driver switching teams and winning instantly like that and beating both Ferrari drivers and having enormous pressure as he did so. It was, it was just one of those days that will just live forever and I was lucky to see it and be there. And I've got to know Max reasonably well, as well as maybe you can, given the fact that he's 18 years old and a Formula One driver. I know Jos very well. And I think it's worth just talking about the build-up to this Red Bull performance, because it began after Russia and Max, and Max was back in Monaco on the Monday after that race, in his flat in Monaco. And Jos was driving across the border into Belgium in Max's free Mercedes C63 that he gets from Mercedes Holland, interestingly. And the phone rang, and it was Helmut Marco, you can see on the display. And he couldn't take the call because he was driving, so he rang him back. He was going through one of the myriad tunnels, there are going to be about six or seven of these on the way to Barcelona Airport. Um, and, it, and, and the phone rang, and it was so he rang back, rang Marco back, and Helmut said, uh, I need you to come to Graz, you and Max to come to Graz. And nothing had ever been said about this move to Red Bull, nothing at any stage. But Jos immediately had a feeling from Marco's tone that something was in the wind, and he just said, for a seat fitting, and Marco just laughed and said, come down to Graz. So they went down, they flew privately to Graz and had lunch at Helmut Marco's restaurant place that he regularly goes to. And Helmut started talking about developments on the Red Bull RB12 and Renault upgrades for Canada and all sorts of things. And Max was sitting there nonplussed. I've, I've actually, I've left one bit out here, which was Max saying to Jos, well, why do I have to go to Graz? This is on after the, after the phone, why do I have to go to Graz? And, and Jos said, trust me, there's something going on, we need to go to Graz. And Max said, yeah, but what? Uh, I don't, you know, I've just got back from a race, what do they want? And then uh, Jos said, trust me, we're going to go to Graz. And then f 15 minutes later, Max said, so what did he say? What did he really say? What, what was his tone of voice? It went like this, but, he, but they still hadn't heard anything at all. So anyway, they're now having lunch. And, uh, and, and Marco's just talking about the car and the team and they've got good engineers at Red Bull and the rest of it. And Max said, well, yeah, I know all that. Are we talking possibly next year? And Marco just looked at him and said, no, next race. And that's the first time. That was the Tuesday after Russia that Max knew about it. And they flew back and he was very excited and happy, as you can imagine. And then almost immediately it was into work mode get to Milton Keynes, do the seat fitting, meet the guys, and so it went. You know, this, it all happened so quickly, and now he's won a Grand Prix, it'll all seem like ancient history very quickly as well. But it was a very, very touching moment, I think, when Max knew for the first time he was gonna be driving for Red Bull. And he, and he just did a perfect job. You know, he was straight into the car, adapted straight away. There was lots to, adapt to, different steering ratio, different feel, different dash, different, obviously different power unit, different everything. And within, you know, whatever it was, a handful of laps, he was right on the pace within a tenth or two of Daniel Ricciardo. And the good thing was, it was a circuit where the Red Bull was actually going very well, and Max immediately sussed out that Sector 3 and how it was going to be so critical and the, and the traction out of section, Sector 3 was extraordinarily good on the RB12. And um, he was phenomenal in qualifying, really good. And, and just everything we've always said, very Lewis Hamilton, lots of straight lines, nothing panicky, no flicks with the rear, everything was just as you should drive a Formula 1 racing car. And when, uh, when he did his time in Q2, and he was ahead of Daniel, I think at that moment, the pressure was really on Daniel Ricciardo. You can't imagine what it would be like for him 
to have this guy come in and go that well. And Daniel only had one run, as we know, and went out and did that time and beat Max by two or three, four tenths. And no problem for you and I would think, great result, and Max would have come out of qualifying thinking, yes. But no, I was chatting to Jos late on Saturday night. All the boys had already left because the cars had got into Parc Ferme and we were in the Red Bull Energy Center in a quiet area, just chatting away. And, uh, and Jos was saying how he, co very correctly, I think, and this is what makes him such a good man, I think, he, he, he decided that now that he's at Red Bull, it's much better for him to take a very low profile and not get involved with anything, just be there enjoy the moment and just to stay in Max's little changing area and watch everything on the TV screen there, not be in the garage, not do any interviews and he's totally correct to do that. And, and I said to uh, to Yoss, so how was he after qualifying? Where, you know, where is he now? What's, what's he doing? Is he back back at the hotel? He said, no, 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 he's with the engineers right now across the, you know, just across the little walkway with the team engineers because he's really, really annoyed that Daniel did that lap time and he's trying to analyze exactly how Daniel did it, tire temperatures, set up brakes, the whole thing. And I thought, wow, what a racer. You know, if that was me, I'd be just sitting back thinking what a great day that was. But no, he was actually quite annoyed with himself that he didn't get more out of the car on the last run in Q3. And then, I was, as I say, I was watching out at Sector 3, which is the definitive sector I've always felt at Barcelona because that leads onto the straight. And as it turned out, it was absolutely the definitive sector because Kimi just could not get near enough, as we now know, late in the race to make a move, even with the assistance of, of DRS. But watching the two Red Bulls in the first early phase of the race was absolutely surreal because they were just pulling away from the field, the two of them, and they were driving as if it was ice on the track. And they were on soft tires at this point, don't, don't forget, soft compound tires. But they looked really, really slow. And yet they were pulling away at a second a lap from, I think it was Carlos Sainz. And then Vettel got clear and started to catch them quite quickly. And, and, I, and at that point, everybody, I think, thought, ah, Vettel victory here, that's what's gonna happen. But then he got to sort of holding station position and all of a sudden his tires started to go away and it became the mode for the pit stop. And when um, Daniel went back out on softs, again, you could think, Daniel Ricciardo, you could think, yeah, this is going to be Daniel Ricciardo's race, maybe even seven, but he and Seb are going to be fighting it out at the end. And when Max was out there on the, on the medium tyre, trying to get five extra laps than anybody thought they could do, you thought, how near actually is Daniel Ricciardo going to be when he comes out? And sure enough, it paid off for Max Verstappen. And I think it paid off, not because he ostensibly ran a two-stop strategy and Daniel Ricciardo a three-stop strategy, but because Max was so good at what he describes and what everybody colloquially describes as managing the tyres, which is shorthand for an incredibly difficult job. And what it means is just keeping the car as straight as much as you can, never locking the unweighted front tyre, and always ensuring that you've got everything in line and perfectly square when you're squeezing on the power because the rears can go as well and that's difficult enough as it is when you're on hard tires or medium tires and the grips going away but when you're doing it with Kimi Raikkonen in your mirrors a red Ferrari and you've got a potential Grand Prix win in front of you I can't even imagine how difficult that was and yet he stayed very calm. He wasn't actually that comfortable in the car because you can do all these seat fittings and you can say, yeah, this is right, that's right. But it's not until you actually do a lot of laps in a car that you really find how your overalls sit in the seat and everything has to be absolutely comfortable. And he actually did get a bit of cramp at the end of the race. No surprise there. Partly because of what he calls the excitement, possibly dehydration of some level uh, because the drink thing wasn't as smooth as it should be as well and partly because of comfort and he thought for a little bit about three laps to go he started to think about his dad he looked at the big scoreboard he could see his number at the top he knew he was leading but it didn't actually sink in that he was actually potentially going to win this grand prix and that the other issues had affected vettel and uh, and daniel and then he crossed the line and placido domingo was on the podium 
shame he didn't sing some sort of aria or something because it was that sort of day and I thought he did a good job Placido asking questions did very well and Max was cool and calm and straightforward and just and it was very funny in the press conference afterwards probably a lot of you have seen that but when somebody asked Max about how he would apportion his gratitude to his dad and or to Helmut Marko and Max started off by saying well from the age of four to 16 I guess obviously it was my dad that sacrificed everything and at this point Sebastian Vettel to his left said what about zero to four <laughs> Max immediately said, yeah, yeah, I guess my mum played a big part as well. His mum's actually pretty good, too, behind the wheel. And uh, and then Seb was quite funny as well. At some point he said, I was just hoping towards the end of the race that I was going to see one of those Dutch caravans with a yellow number plate towing some red, red ball around on the inside, on the infield. But it never happened. And Ferrari were beaten. That's another video as well, I think. Before we get on to that, final word about Max Verstappen and the way he handled himself after the victory. He's not going to change at all. It's very, I've said this in F1 Racing, I've said it many times. It reminds me a lot of Michael and the way he handles himself. Very clear in his head about the important aspects of racing, fields questions about his age very very well he says well I don't really think about it I just go racing which is obvious and I think we have yeah we've had the birth of a new superstar here and I and I think he will become huge because he's so good he's so good at this age it's almost I'm driving now back to Barcelona airport and just suddenly to think wow Max Verstappen won the Spanish Grand Prix it's, um, you know and he could, what, he could win Monaco too, guess what? The Red Bull are going to be really quick at run for Monaco. It's all about traction. He's got to beat Daniel Ricciardo. Not going to be easy. And of course, you have to feel for Daniel Ricciardo at the end of this Grand Prix. He's the guy that's been with Red Bull through the bad times. And now they're coming up again. And they've won a race. And the win. And we've seen it many times. And it often happens that the win has gone to... Max Verstappen, the new kid on the block, has just arrived. First race. You've seen it many times in racing, and it won't be the last time it happens as well. You just have to swallow it and move on. And Daniel has to believe in himself, and there's plenty in which to believe, that's for sure. The other guy that you'd be really feeling for would be not Carlos Sainz, because he had a good race and he's there, and Toro Rosso is still doing his thing, but Daniel Kavir, who was a grandstand observer of the Vettel Ricardo battle when he was being lapped just lap behind and who would have come in after the race to find that Max Verstappen had won the Spanish Grand Prix so it wouldn't have been a good day for Daniel Kvyat but what a day for Max Verstappen and both Ferrari drivers to their credit after a while of answering questions said yeah but you know we shouldn't be talking this day belongs to Max and they're absolutely right